Okay, and this is Embriano's trying to join, so she's trying to find the link, but I'm gonna call this meeting to 31 p.m. and say, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general laws, chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the effort, every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings that's provided for in this order. <clears throat> so welcome everybody. We're gonna <clears throat> begin, I know for terms of attendance, I think we have, um, we have the vice chair, Mr. McGowan here. We have Mrs. Boutwell here, Mr. Papa, Vase Papa Vasileo here and Janine and Brianna's not here yet. I will note when she comes in. And we are joined by, looks like most of the administration of the school district. So <clears throat> thank you, um, everybody. To begin, we're gonna start with public input. So if anybody is here that would like to comment or have a question about something that is not on the agenda tonight, please you know, feel free to chat or just unmute yourself and you can jump in here. Hearing none, <clears throat> I think we have a student report tonight. And so now, Mr. I, Dr. Daly always sets me up on these and puts the wrong class year to make fun of me every time. So I'm hoping that we have Paris uh, McCall, uh, McAuliffe, McAuliffe, class of 2023. Paris, are you here? Um, yes, hello. Hi, Paris. Are you class of 2023, first and foremost? Class of 2023, yes. <laughs> nice. The first time I've gotten it right this year so far. So welcome. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Paris McAuliffe, uh, class of 23, 2023. Okay. So student report, we can start with academics. Um, PSAT results just came back. Um, the not, Yeah, PSATs are open to only juniors. And I'm sure students are very relieved to get those as waiting on test results is a bit anxiety inducing. Um, midterms have also been kind of suspended for this year, as you guys may know. So I know sophomores, I took midterms um, last year and then no finals, obviously, in the spring and no midterms this year. And I can't complain. And I don't know many students who would. <laughs> um, yeah, times of corona, there's a lot of stress, uh, so this just takes off a bunch of it. I also know for um, advancement, advanced placement AP classes that uh, teachers are relieved to have that extra week to um, uh, to teach the information because AP tests will not be canceled, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, there's also been uh, a rise in concern for due dates. Some teachers have no are no longer giving students that two-day period to complete their homework assignments and i know students are kind of feeling stressed with time management um what i mean by that is typically you know you get a side swing on a green day and you have until that next green day to complete it but teachers have been assigning the homework to be due like the same day that they get it at like 10 o'clock at night seven o'clock at night and I know students, some aren't even home after school until seven o'clock. So it's, um, they're trying to figure out how to get that homework done in time. And I believe Dr. Daly said that, that Mr. LaPrette is open to having a conversation with that during our student representative meeting today. Um, following with academics, report cards, the quarter ended on the 20th of November and report cards were sent out via the eLocker on Plus Portals uh, for the first time, no longer in mail, so just another adjustment in times of corona. Uh, we move on to the fine arts. Uh, Maskers is holding auditions for their play next week, the 17th and the 18th, for The Everyman. Um, in athletics, winter sports tryouts begin on Monday for uh, boys and girls basketball, swim, and hockey. And I'm sure maskers and athletes are anticipating and awaiting to see how their season plays out. <laughs> um, if we go on to clubs, Interact finished up their leaf raking, which they offer to community members. They also started 
uh, neighborly notes. Uh, students can volunteer and sign up to write notes to the community members. Um, if you write 10 of them, you can submit that and get one hour community service. So that's good. Student council next week is having um, ugly sweater day. The intent behind that is you wear an ugly sweater for um, your support of Special Olympics, SOMA, which uh, Student Council works very closely with. As well as on the 23rd, Student Council is having our uh, annual in-house training. Uh, this year we're focusing a lot on diversity and importantly, like how to be a leader outside of community that does not look like North Reading looks. Uh, Eco Team planning to do a mask fundraiser. There's been a lot of success in that area, so I'm sure they'll have the same. And then the last thing on my report is last Thursday, American Sign Language had their first club meeting, and I hear it went very successful with over 30 participants. So that's all I got. <laughs> that's wonderful. Great, great update. Anybody have questions or comments? And I'll start off, Paris, and just say you, you mentioned the American Sign Language. We approved that club last time. Were you are you a member of that now, or were you just was that just an update you had heard? I am not a member, but I heard from Miss Sainer now that it went well. Excellent. Anybody else has questions? We have a very good report. So thank you very much, Paris. I'm interested to hear about the homework next time and see how that goes. Mr. LaPratt. Yes. Uh, I was just going to say, for the record, Mr. LaPratt has happened to me with students at any time around topics that are interest uh, to them. So we, we can catch up, Paris. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, if I may, it came, it came up today, and um, Mr. LaPrette, you know, one of his goals as a school administrator is to just get feedback from students and staff and how things are going. And I think one of the items with Google Classroom that the students mentioned was that sometimes you have a due date. Um, and just so, you know, maybe maybe something we can look at is trying to see if we can normalize when things are due. As she mentioned, some students have after school activities and, um, you know, so maybe there's a way to do that. So I think, you know, that's part of our goal is to constantly hear feedback and, and continuously improve it. So. We appreciate that being shared. Excellent. Well, there's no more questions. We're going to move right along for continued business. In Paris, you can feel free to stay as long as you'd like, or if you have homework to do, because we know it's due by 10 o'clock, you're uh, more than welcome to uh, jump out if you need. <laughs> so for, for continuing business, we'll start with the reopening update. So I'll turn it over to Superintendent Dr. Daly, and I will reflect for the Record that uh, Janine and Briano is here as well. Dr. Daly. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Buckley. So there's some major points I wanted to hit on here. We're gonna speak a little bit about um, testing a little bit later in the evening. Um, but tonight I just wanna talk about, you know, the work we're doing with the community level data, the school data, our hybrid model. Talk a little bit about winter, uh, winter sports, performing arts and other related topics. Um, you know, we are seeing an uptick in the community. I will, I will say, though, when we're sharing and comparing numbers, um, we are doing very well as compared with, with surrounding districts. I think that that's a, a testament to the great work that, you know, our, our leaders in town are doing to keep um, the messaging out and certainly to every single uh, parent and community member and student who are following rules and wearing masks and, and social distancing and keeping their... Um, keeping themselves safe because I think our numbers in North Reading, although they're, they're something to be concerned about, we certainly um, are doing, are doing as well as we can be doing. So, you know, it's certainly um, something we need to be aware of is also the number of <clears throat> positive cases in our schools. We still do not have any signs of transmission within the school. Um, but we have had, you know, even today I sent out, there was another uh, two, to uh, students and staff member today. So our totals for, for right now, we have um, 13 employees and 18 students total since the year began. Um, again, all of these cases to our knowledge, to the best of our knowledge are unrelated. Um, in some cases there are siblings or family members involved, but I'm saying that there has not been evidence of transmission at school. 
So, you know, I've been asking a lot of stakeholders about the communication piece, and it does feel it's sometimes a little bit exhaustive with all the emails that are coming out. But, you know, we go, we go back and forth on that because we think it's very important to make sure we're communicating. Every, every positive case needs to be reported to the state and to the Department of Education. And I think it's very important for everyone in the school community to be aware whenever there is a positive case. And I know it can be a bit of um, fatigue to, to be constantly getting emails, but it's also a reminder that this is very real and it is out there and, and we are seeing an uptick in positive cases. So my, my plan is to continue to send the, the emails. A lot of districts have gone to just having a dashboard or um, not publishing the letters, but the, at least the internal folks that I've spoken to. I know that we had uh, one case where, um, do, you know, the, there was some fact checking we were doing and we didn't put out about a positive case at one school until the next day. And, and you know, that principal had a few teachers in his office that next morning saying, how come we didn't get the, the update? So I think, I think it does help lower the anxiety level that folks know that, you know, anything that they're aware of, we are also reporting and following through on. So that's, that's our plan right now. And I, I don't know if there's any feedback from the committee on that, but I do, I do think about um, having a dashboard as well on our website. If people, because the numbers are high and just to get a sense of, you know, I, I know I've heard some people say when, when Dr. Daly sends out an email, is this, a, is this the same case or a new case? So they're always new. Whenever I send out an update, it's always a new one. But because the numbers are, are, are getting higher, I think having a dashboard for those that want to look a little bit deeper just to see the counts and the numbers, uh, we might publish that as well for folks to look at. So I'm, I'm welcome to any thoughts on that. Anybody want to jump in? Uh, I will, Scott. It's Rich. Um... I, I think continuing the communication is, is a good idea. I would not, I mean, I was thinking maybe you could do a weekly email of an update of a sort of recap of the week, but it does feel like timely, you know, people pr would prefer to just hear that information timely. I think a dashboard is a great idea because, especially if it can show, um, you know, something similar, to, you know, we don't have enough cases to make this too meaningful, but something similar to a, a seven day average rolling average or something like that, where you can sort of see the chain, you know, the increase or decrease of cases over time. Um, so I do think that's a good, be a great idea if, if it could be done reasonably. Yeah, right now, the model I was using was just sort of a monthly update. Um, but I could break it down more than that if, if need be. I mean, I, I, I like the daily updates or the, the, the individual case updates because you also get it, for example, a text message. And if it's a dashboard or I, I think it just tells you what's happening. And it also points out that every case is important. Um, you know, I, I just if you did a dashboard, the one thing that would I think would be interesting would see when people are back in school too, to sort of show, move it from like open to close, like kids are back from this one. Because when you mentioned there's 13 and 18, you know, I don't know how many of those people are still out, but then the community would be able to see that, okay, we have a few people that are out right now, and that might, you know, you know, show if we uh, end up having a situation where a school has too many faculty out. But overall, I think it's, and I, I've, I've heard a lot of positive feedback about the communication, and so I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to lower the communication that's being given, personally. Yeah, and what, I, I would just comment on the, the showing who's out. Um, Again, this would only represent positive individuals. It wouldn't represent close contacts. There are a lot of people out because they're close contact of someone else. And then there's, you know, there's other reasons why people are out as well. So um, it wouldn't really provide that whole picture. And and I think we're, you know, we, we would certainly be communicating if we were ever close. Quite honestly, if we were ever had um, any sign of transmission within a school, we'd probably be communicating with that school about, you know, the, the potential of needing to close the school for a temporary amount of time. But I don't see that happening right now. All, all these measures that we're taking are to, to keep schools open, including, you know, anything we would do with testing ultimately is to keep schools open. So. Yeah. And I think, I think the other point I would just make on that one is, and I see you Diana afterwards. Um, I think the other, the other point I would just make is a lot of these cases, these notifications are coming out are showing that the student wasn't in school. So I just applaud the, you know, the parents and the students for being responsible and, you know, waiting to they get tests if they were traveling, 
if they do feel sick, staying home, that is, you know, the most important thing of all is that if somebody doesn't feel good, you know, stay home, you know, do remote learning for a couple of days until you can get checked out. And hopefully it's just, you know, a couple of days of remote learning until you get a, a negative test. But, you know, it's good to see that a lot of the cases that are coming back positive, the students weren't in school or the faculty. Ms. Boutwell? Good, good point. <laughs> Patrick, I was just going to agree. I mean, both from a committee member and a parent, I, I think you should keep doing the emails in, in a timely manner. I mean, for me, it's not just informative, but it's actionable. Like if I saw something of concern or maybe, you know, pe parents and, and individuals have a certain level of tolerance too. And so if I maybe saw a lot of frequency, regardless if they were in school or out, of helpful for me to make decisions too. Um, you know, at the batch, I might say, hey, maybe I want to switch my child to, you know, the full remote. And I feel like you're giving parents the information to make decisions should they choose to do that for their family. And that's why I think the timely manner is important. And then just in terms of, um, you know, dashboarding, I, I think, you know, just showing cumulative, and I'm not saying that's what you were envisioning, um, probably isn't the best, but, it, you know, I don't know if it's a maintenance nightmare to report the information on, you know, what's actually actively, you know, fo folks that are actively out of school um, to your point and, and how much maintenance that would be. Um, I would just, you know, evaluate the value proposition there and, and how much work and effort it takes. But um, I certainly with the emails hope that you continue doing exactly what you're doing. Great. Thank you. Hi. Any more updates on reopening after through the year? <laughs> yes. So yes, we're calling it. We should probably just retitle this now to hybrid reopening. There, there is a lot more information coming from the state level about um, the time, the student learning time. I do anticipate that the data we've submitted that they will be um, that that we are among some of the the most time in school um, and some of the most amount of time that students are in live uh, synchronous opportunities when they are in the remote portion of hybrid. But we, I do await more information from the state on that from the Department of Ed. Um, I wanted to share about the winter sports again, as was mentioned by Paris, that it is beginning um, very soon and we do have provisions in place. There's still a lot of talk out there among districts about their participation, but it's, it does seem from everything Mr. LaPrette and, and Mr. Johnson have been in so many meetings about this, and then we've met as well. Um, we, are, we are moving ahead with, with a lot of precautions. I've sat through some individual sport meetings and uh, you know, I sat through basketball and they have really, they've thought of every single out of bounds play call, what we're gonna do to try to limit, um, to limit the contact. So. You know, I, I think everyone wants students to play and to get out there and get an opportunity, and we're going to take our, our absolute best shot. We had great luck in the fall, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting as many opportunities as possible for students to play. Performing arts, I just want to give a moment, and I know that we spoke about this in our subcommittee meeting, but Miss um, Lister and Miss uh, Kane, who've done a, just a great job of staying abreast of the guidance that's coming out, not only from the Department of Ed at the state level, but out of the National Music and Performing Arts Associations at the federal level, um, when they're, they're updating and changing their, guide, their guidance for what's, what's happening and what's safe. And so I wanted to talk tonight about the plans. We, we have concrete plans to be uh, bringing our students indoors. And so, you know, as you're aware, when the students are outdoors, they've been able to perform. Um, and play instruments and sing. When they're indoors for these courses, they have been, um, for the most part, doing alternate activities indoors that are not quite what they would typically do in a typical year. Um, we have taken a very careful look at all of the safety guidelines. Um, they, they've actually recently, at the, at the federal level, uh, changed it from uh, 10 feet down to six feet, but we would still maintain that 10 foot level that, that was in our initial guidance. We've found all different um, face shield screens, uh, ways to basically play an instrument while essentially still wearing a mask. You know, it's, there's some slits in the mask so that you can play an instrument 
Um, but being very, very careful with this, following all guidelines and identifying spaces in the building that are not being occupied and are not near other students. So we've worked with uh, the principals. This is essentially really a, a secondary conversation right now. This is, this is different at the elementary schools um, at this time. So really for the secondary, the full courses that are being taught, the students would be coming indoors and also being able to uh, perform as long as they're in those spaces. So we're going to utilize uh, like a large open space, you know, parts of Main Street, for example, when nobody's there. So at night, we might be able to have some, some uh, you know, our jazz band might be able to play there. Using one of our cafeterias when there's no students in there for lunch, um, spread out at a large distance, and to follow all those rules. So, you know, I just wanted to send out, my hope was, if, if, if everyone approved tonight, that we, you know, we decided we would not start this until next week. I wanted to share this with the committee tonight and then send out something tomorrow to make sure everyone is aware. Because I think, you know, we're, there, there is a concern, obviously, about, you know, all of those types of performances and the droplets, and we've talked about it quite a bit. And I want everyone to be very clear that we've done all the research. We've, we've completely maximized um, the space, and it's, it's at the safest possible distances. I think our teachers at the, at the high school and the middle school are very, very aware of the standards, and, and I – I have the fullest confidence and trust. I believe Mr. LaPret and Ms. O'Connell do as well. We've met several times. And so we do hope to be able to start that next week. So any thoughts on that? I'm in support. Anybody else? Um, having listened to um, Ms. Lister and Ms. Kane talk about this, I, I uh, uh, can endorse that they, they've thought an awful lot about it. And I trust that, uh, that they've come to the right solution. So yeah, I'm in support too. I agree completely with Rich. Uh, as we pointed out at our last meeting, they've been incredibly thorough. And uh, I trust that they've thought of everything important. I'm in favor. OK, great. And, and Janine, I may not be able to communicate it, but yeah. all right. No, sorry, I am in favor too. Just. <laughs> Not having luck with my iPad tonight. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Connolly, was there anything you wanted to add as a part of our, our, our update for school? Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Daly. Just a couple of really quick things on the operational end, end of things. Um, the community may have seen some kind of regular updates regarding the food service program and the, um, the fact that we continue to operate um, both a free mails program from now until the end of the year. There was an update given earlier in the week. And every time we, we do that, and I think it kind of works as a little bit of a reminder for the community and for, for folks, and we do get a little bit of an uptick and an increase in participation. So we are we are just hoping that that continues as the communications have um, announced. We do get you know federal funding for for every mail that is is provided and it's it's there for both obviously students learning in school and then students that are at home learning remotely either all the time or in the hybrid model and just are having um, remote days for those days of the week um, and we recently started serving mails for the weekend as well so we're just hoping that that participation continues to increase we have seen a, a gradual increase in that as the the year has gone on and um, the daily you know, average amount of mails provided has has gone up, which is which is great to see. Um, but we we continue to um, want to just promote and, and market that program. And the food service workers are, are really doing an excellent job. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with them earlier in the week just to kind of check in after a few months, and they're they're really working hard. And, and I think they're providing a high quality, um, nutritious, nourishing, um, both breakfast and, and lunch mail for for the community. So. So that, that, that continues to, to occur, and um, there was some updates, communication on, on that as well. Um, so that really, that's kind of my, my only update. I think, I think certainly you know, other operational stamp, you know, aspects in terms of busing and so forth have been going relatively smooth. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about this in the budget update, but we are advertising our 
our bus specifications this week. As you know, that contract does come to an end this, this year. And I think I announced at the last meeting that we would look to do this in early to mid December. So that, that bid gets officially released today, actually. And um, we're hoping we get kind of a good response and get at least two or three um, bids and make that a competitive process as well. So, um, so that's really it. That's all the updates I had. I don't know if there's any questions on any of the operational end of things. I'll go to the committee first for any comments or thoughts on reopening. I have, I have two that I'll start with and just say, and just the first one is Dr. Dale, you mentioned that there's some state uh, statistics about number of hours in school and synchronous learning. I would be very interested to see that. Um, and I think sometimes, like I think the members of this committee, m many of us are in associations where we see a little bit more comparison data. And I think, you know, you guys do as well, but I think sometimes for the parents, it would be good to sort of see what our teachers and our, uh, our our staff is doing and so i would i would encourage in some way just to sort of share some of that information out um you know i, I just think it, i think parents would appreciate that and and if it shows that you know we really are and i think we all know that we've done everything we can to you know get as many people students back in as we can i think that'd be good information to share with the public Sure. The, my understanding is that they're going to present this to the board of uh, education at the state level. And then following that, there'll be some information shared with us. I, I think I might be something later this week um, from them. They said something like 71% of the districts that are um, in hybrid are going to um, meet, their, meet the standards they're looking for. And then there's a smaller percentage that might have to make some adjustments. Yeah. I mean, similar to when, when the, when we were trying to create the plans, I think you were very forthcoming and sharing the information that we received from the state on what was required. Um, and then the only other thing I would just point out is just randomly in my in my day to day life, my work. I was talking to a band teacher today, and I said something about smart music, and you know, I know my son in chorus has had some challenges here or there, and she was like, "Oh, I wish we could afford smart music." And so, like, and and we just got in a little bit of a conversation, and again, it was just one of those things where. You know, I had heard some people complaining here or there, but she said it's, she's like, it's one of the top of the line programs and our district can't even afford that. And so, yeah, I think, I think it's just worth pointing out every once in a while that like we are doing the best we can to provide the absolute best tools we can. It's not an ideal system, any of this, but, you know, we're trying to, you know, do the best we can um, and use the best, uh, you know, programs that are out there as well. And if anybody else has any comments or questions. <laughs> I, I just, it just occurred to me that uh, the meals program uh, it feels like it's a, a, a good opportunity for a marketing program. I didn't know, Mr. Lepret, if there were any uh, business classes that might want to take on that mantle uh, as a project, but uh, uh, how to sell the, the free meals program. Uh, if, you can, if you can't sell something that's free, I don't know what, what you could do. I've been working with uh, Mr. Connolly on... Uh, his his specific uh, regs and things around something like that, of course. Absolutely, yeah, that would be great. Absolutely. And if there's any, and if there's ever any members of the public that would like to comment, please, you know, feel free to message in the chat or um, put your name, and I can call on you as well. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to go a little bit out of order on the agenda because I'm not going to bore everybody here with policies because that took a little bit too long last time. Um, and we do have some students here as well as administrators. So I'm going to jump ahead to the new business and come back to the policy reading. And Mr. McGowan, please remind me if I forget to come back to it. Um, I'm going to start with, we have, just like last time, we have a couple of proposals for new clubs. And I think we're joined by, I, I think I see both students here. so. The first one is Team Cure, which was developed, um, will be presented by Josephine Ferrante. Ferrante. Um, and so Josephine, if you want to unmute and maybe walk us through Team Cure. Yeah, sure thing. So I'm here um, with Kelly Crossan, and we're presenting a club called Team Cure. Um, can everyone see this? Loading. Yeah. Yes. Yep, it's coming. 
Okay. So Team Cure is an organization founded in North Andover by a girl our age named Lindsay Pacios. And since then, an Andover branch has also opened up. And what they do is they really just find out ways to help children who are living with cancer. So they have three main methods. One of them is that they create personalized care packages. Another one is that they visit children in the hospital or in their homes. And finally, they have something called wishes where they do something special for the kids, like take them on an outing or maybe dress up as their favorite Disney character just to bring them a little bit of joy. So how will North Reading help? Um, the North Reading Club would focus on the care package part of it. And what we would do is we would receive assignments from the other branches and we would get to pick the pace at which we received our assignments and the amount of children that we take on per month. And meetings would happen in a spaced out classroom and students who are remote that day can zoom in so they can also participate a lot like how we're doing school these days. And during the meetings, we'll plan out care packages, go over assignments and create personalized cards. Because of the current situation, uh, a lot of the care packages we assembled and delivered through an online format such as Amazon wishlist, just to ensure the highest level of safety. But under normal circumstances, we would be able to do those as a club in the classroom. So moving on, Kelly, would you like to take it from here? Okay, yeah, so basically for fundraising, because we have to start earning some money so we can pay for these, um, pay for their wish list items. And so we have a few ideas that could work for uh, circumstances, including um, contacting local businesses. Like we were thinking Discoli's or the Hornet's Nest, a lot of places that a lot of other clubs use to just have people go there and get food and we get a percentage of the money they earn as donations to our club. Uh, under normal circumstances, obviously we could do like bake sales and other in-school events, but right now we're just focusing on the um, ways we can do it now, like the uh, contacting local businesses. And then, so we, act, we have a group, me, set up club already. We have um, some school officer positions that have been filled. Josie's the president, the vice president. Um, we have a secretary who is uh, Kira Lord, and we have two co-treasurers, Lauren Bedoya and um, Ellie Janisiewicz. And we have um, about 23 students um, who have already um, expressed interest in joining the club. And so we think we have a pretty good, pretty good group of kids uh, ready for um, to help the children. And yeah, that's our presentation. Uh, we can take any questions now if anybody has any. Excellent. Mr. McGowan, you have a question? I don't have a question, except that it sounds like a great uh, idea, I guess. Um, so it's interesting that you, you that you, you're you're, it's feeding off of the clubs that were already joined. Is there at some point, does, does it become more independent or, or, or will the clubs from the various communities always work together? How does that work? Well, the three branches would connect in ways like um, dividing up the children and giving assignments because like the head branch is in North Andover, but North Reading, we have complete freedom with assembling the care packages and finding ways to fundraise. So in that regard, it's all independent. And my only question would be of, of the 23 students that are interested, is it a distribution across the four grades or is it primarily one, one grade? We have um, a good amount of those students are in the junior class, but we also have um, a good amount of sophomores, a couple of freshmen. I don't, I'm not sure we had seniors involved yet, but we still haven't really gotten the word out. Okay. I, I think it's a good idea. Support you guys. Any other questions? Questions or comments on it? This is Imbriano. Um, I I think it's a incredible idea, and I you know I applaud you guys for for doing that. Um, <clears throat> do you have a contact with like Children's Hospital, Tufts, um, or? Does the lead person in North Andover who started it, does she have the contacts with those people? How, you know, yeah. how do you find the patients? So the lead girl, Lindsay Pacios, who kind of runs the whole thing, 
she's the one who's primarily in contact with like the families and the hospitals, and then she just passes the information down to the other two branches. Okay, so she has a contact at one of the oncology departments at, at the hospitals then? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, if you need more contacts, I have firsthand knowledge of one at Tufts Children. So if you, you know, are looking for more, let me know. How Thank you. you. Thank you, Janine. Mr. LaPrat. Thank you. Um, I just want to congratulate Josephine. Um, and Kelly uh, for presenting. Nice job. Uh, looking forward to the prospect of having uh, Team Cure as an active club this year. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. Fantastic job. Okay, so if there's no more comments or questions, I'd entertain a vote to approve Team Cure as a, a North Reading High School club for this year. I would gladly like to make the motion to um, have Project Cure become a club at the high school. Second. Okay. Any discussion? We'll do a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes by zero. Congratulations. Okay. And we have one more. We have Shivani Shrikanth, who I think we all know is one of our reps as well. And Shivani, I think you're here to present on social activism as another club. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you all for allowing us to come and kind of pitch this idea. Um, is my screen sharing? <laughs> Not yet. All right. Let's see. It doesn't say loading yet either, so. <clears throat> there we go. You're good to go. Awesome. Oh, starting to load again. Yeah, it could just be, just be my Wi-Fi. Hopefully it'll. We all have the package too, and if you need, we can, okay. there we go. Awesome. Done. Okay, um, so as many of you know, my name is Shivi Shrikanth and I'm a student rep for these meetings as well. Um, this is just an idea that me and a couple of my peers have been tossing around for the past couple of months and we thought we would try to implement it within the school. Um, I'm also joined today by the proposed vice president for this club, Veronica Stancheva, and she's here as well to kind of present alongside me. Um, and then we also have some support from our proposed advisor, Mr. Blum, who is also on this call. Um, so essentially what we're planning on trying to implement with the Social Activism Club is a new diverse um, initiative that kind of promotes education, um, advocacy, and diversity within our town and our school. Um, just to run through a quick table of contents of what we plan to cover in this presentation. Um, the overview and purpose of such a club and the main concepts for its implementation, the topics and events a club like this might carry out, um, and then some opinions and statistics regarding student interest as well as some past um, precedents set by other social activism clubs, and then some additional information about potential avenues for the club to take. Um, just starting with a quick little overview, um, social activism clubs and diversity-oriented groups have become common fixtures in high schools over the past decade, and we definitely believe that one in North Reading is long overdue. Um, these clubs are key factors in student development, and they promote individuality, freedom of thought, and diversity, which is especially important in today's climate. Um, and we definitely believe that a club like this in North Reading could fill a gap and create a safe platform for topics that are often neglected, as well as a safe space for like minorities and allies and people willing to engage in open dialogue. Good evening, everyone. My name is Veronica Sancheva. Thanks so much for having us. I'm just going to be discussing the purpose of this club. So with a social activism club, our mission is to promote tolerance and awareness for different social issues and minorities and provide a safe space for all students, regardless of identity and belief. 
We believe that the students of North Reading High School can benefit from learning more about populations and minorities that they have never before interacted with and can gain a better understanding of their own world worldviews. Many students are near the voting age and we hope to foster critical thinking and understanding around relevant social issues. Some of our Club topics include animal rights, which we hope to promote environmental and ecological awareness, disability advocacy, uh, we strive to advocate for accessibility, safety, and community acceptance for those who are differently abled, racial awareness, we want to promote education, advocacy, and sensitivity towards communities of color, as well as cultural understandings of minorities. Gender studies, we plan to explore identity and representation as well as gender inequalities and women's rights to bring awareness to issues that affect all. LGBTQ plus inclusivity, we plan to work alongside the GSA in order to continue to, keep, to keeping NRH safe for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, moving on to some potential events that we feel could potentially um, increase our impact within the town and also encourage diversity. We are planning on bringing in guest speakers um, and bring in certified guest speakers of different backgrounds, races, and identities um, and ensure that there is firsthand education for NRHS students about different communities. We also are thinking about promoting cultural fairs um, by organizing events like cultural fairs, marches. And we can empower students to have a platform for advocating for their beliefs. And then by holding debates, we believe that sharing thoughts and ideas with one another can guarantee that we'll keep our actions open-minded, civil, and apolitical. And then we also are planning on participating in some sorts of community outreach by participating in community-oriented events like Pride and Black and Brown Markets. We can encourage volunteering with social justice in mind. The benefits of a social activism club include inclusivity, safe spaces, care for the community, open-mindedness, and personal development. Um, with inclusivity, it is very important as we welcome more minority students in North Reading. Open-mindedness is very important because North Reading is very homogeneous. Therefore, therefore, students don't get the opportunity to interact and learn about diverse minority populations. In order to prep NRHS students for adulthood and a diverse world where we can learn to engage with while also being accepting of minority populations and with personal development we want to encourage our peers and help them learn to engage themselves in civil engagement the development of safe spaces is very important because it allows minorities and allies to have a space to feel comfortable Um, and then you'll also notice here that we did uh, distribute a survey to kind of gather student interest and gather a little bit of opinions regarding such a club. We distributed the survey to over 150 students and we got a majorly positive response. 63 of those students responded and indicated a general agreement for such a club and expressed interest in joining one. We also included um, some questions on what aspects of the club they felt would be most important for us to tackle. And if we get approved, we plan on implementing these um, topics as well as emphasizing them in whatever we do. Some of these include spreading awareness and NR on social issues, um, focusing on educating youth um, in school, and then also being open to all students regardless of political and social beliefs and advocating for those who are not represented. Activism at Concord Carlisle High School, open to all students, activism club members seek to become effective and passionate activists on issues that affect our community and communities around the country. Students set the agenda and organize projects. Past and continuing projects include hosting forums with members of the community, organizing voter registration drives, and working on lowering the voting age in municipal elections. We are open to tackling all issues that students feel passionate about and we welcome student input in our continuing mission to be active minded global citizens. Um, many schools in Massachusetts that are highly ranked in education have incorporated activism in their school system and we think that if we contributed this to the North Reading High School school system, it would be very beneficial. Yes, so um, 
This specific excerpt is taken from the Concord Carlisle website, and this is one of their most popular clubs within their school. Um, kind of along that line, this is um, a statistic that we found kind of based around the concept of activism and social justice and diversity. Um, and it kind of speaks to the importance of active support within schools and other institutions within a community. Um, when asked about the obstacles keeping them, and in this case, it's Gen Z students, from participating in political or social justice causes, 55% said that not knowing who to contact or what groups to support tripped them up. Um, and this is kind of where we would come in as a, as a group that is planning on kind of encouraging education and awareness around topics that could potentially inform students on voting decisions, further civil action, and um, further civil engagement in their lives, as well as understanding um, government, understanding social issues, understanding minority populations. We feel that we could definitely fill in a gap um, in North Reading High School and kind of spread education on these topics that are often neglected. Um, kind of along that note, we also want to stress the apolitical and nonpartisan nature of this club. We want to be accepting of all students, um, regardless of different political beliefs or affiliations. And we just want to create kind of a safe space for open dialogue. Um, and we will definitely encourage activism and diversity in all, all senses of the word. Um, for example, if a student came to us wanting to learn more about activism for the police force or for the police department, we would, of course, encourage and um, allow them to come in with open arms and choose whatever they want to advocate for. It's definitely not restricted to topics that we have listed here. It's truly student run. Um, and we would for sure encourage and promote their advocacy with adequate resources as well as advice. Um, regardless of the political implications that you might feel that might come along with such a club, we are very, very committed to keeping all of our actions and all of our intentions um, apolitical and nonpartisan. And kind of just to wrap this up, we wanted to talk about um, this new slide that we just recently added. So this idea of a social activism, social justice, diversity club has been tossed around within NRY4A, which is a youth group in town, um, which is North Reading Youth for Anti-Racism and of which I am the president. And um, we've been tossing this idea around for months, but we just recently added this slide just to clear up a couple of misconceptions. Um, so just to kind of redirect what we intend this club to be, we mean it to be a means for education, advocacy, empowerment, and diversity. And we definitely feel that this could go hand in hand with the newly proposed civil action project, um, which is kind of the new volunteering requirements for our students. Um, so with such a club, we believe that participation in our club would allow students to have the opportunity to participate in events that kind of relate to their project action plans. Um, they would also get the chance to become educated on issues and explore topics that could inform the objective of their overall project. And then they could also utilize club resources, connections, and advice to carry out a successful final civil action project. Um, we just really wanted to stress how we feel like our club could cooperate with this new, this new school initiative. And yeah, that's our entire presentation. If there are any questions, we'd love to take them now. I, I will just start off by saying you guys are so impressive. I mean, next time I need to do a presentation, I'm hiring the two of you to come and uh, run it for me. Um, I mean, I think Shivy, we've heard you speak a number of times on these issues and you know, I think you are an impressive young woman. You're an impressive person, you know, and a representative of the students in this, you know, this community and you know, Veronica, you also did an excellent job here. And so, you know, I mean, I support the, you know, the club. I support you guys doing this. And, you know, I think you're very thoughtful in what you've come out with here. And, you know, I, I appreciate it. Um, Mr. McGowan, I see your hand is raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I agree. Great job on the presentation, uh, Shivy and Veronica. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about how you would uh, think to, you talked about being open to, to folks with different, uh, different ideas of uh, where they're, what direction their activism might take, um, and how you would, uh, handle, uh, 
uh, students who might come in with some ideas that, um, like, for instance, a majority of the club didn't agree with or, or, or that just were somewhat opposed to some of the stated goals, uh, stated causes in, that, that you've listed? Of course, yes, I could definitely speak to that. Um, so our goal of this club is mostly to um, inform open dialogue between students of all backgrounds, all political affiliations, especially as this is a time that we're all trying to figure out kind of what we believe, what our morals are, what our values are. I definitely think something like this is necessary. So obviously the people who've expressed interest in such a club are aware of the kind of topics that would be tackled within it. Um, but we definitely would not, we would not condone any um, negative arguing, nothing like that. If there were any members of the club that disagreed with maybe a differing opinion that came in, then that would definitely have to be dealt with. But we do want to promote completely nonpartisan, completely peaceful, um, open dialogue, as well as the actual activism itself. Um, it is going to be entirely student run. So we will provide resources and advice on whatever a specific student might want to tackle as a part of this group. Um, if somebody did want to come in and perhaps had a differing opinion and wanted to tackle that as something they wanted to um, openly advocate for, then we would 100% provide them with the resource and resources and advice they need in order to succeed in that. We definitely don't want to gatekeep anyone based on their beliefs. We just want to kind of provide some sort of open place for that activism. Yeah, thanks. I, I, it, it, it relies an awful lot on everyone approaching it uh, with from from a position of good faith. And uh, I think that's one of the tricky things, but it sounds like you've thought a lot about it. So thanks. OK, we have a couple of hands up. Mr. Hain. Hi, um, great presentation um, for both clubs. And I just wanted to let people know that these clubs and these ideas have been percolating for a long time and they've hit some different roadblocks along the way and I don't know if um, people know the book the last lecture but there's a, a segment in there that says you know brick walls are made to find how hard you want something to happen that that's why you have to go through the wall and these girls certainly have gone through some some brick walls to make this happen for both clubs so their persistence and their perseverance has, has been impressive. So I'm, I'm so glad they got to present tonight. I think they were good ideas and they learned that if you really want something, it's worth working for. So this is, both clubs had a really good example of showing this tonight. So I'm, I'm very proud of um, um, them and their advisors were also key in keeping them motivated. So great, great to see it coming to tonight. Excellent, excellent points. This is in Oh, Ms. Dr. Daly. Nope, someone else had their hand, sorry. Uh, yeah, we have a couple more. We have uh, Mrs. Imbriano. <clears throat> Hi. Um, where, just out of pure curiosity, are you guys finding all of your resources, um, resources for the variable questions that are coming through, that may come through? Um, is it a, a source? Not, I'm not gonna say like Wikipedia or something like that, but is there a human source as well? Is this regarding um, promoting resources for advocacy within, like, the high school? No, just for, like, uh, there's such a broad subject matter that could be brought into your club. Um, you seem to be very versed on certain things, but if someone brought in a topic that you weren't necessarily versed in, like maybe, I don't know, you mentioned something about police or something, would you then go to the North Reading Police Department or is there someone that you know that you can go to or a, a website or a, you know what I'm saying? Like, where do you get your information to then disperse out to everyone else? Right, right, of course. Um, so this, I have put a little bit of thought into how that would occur. Um, currently, I'm a part of the Human Rights Commission within town, and that has a few different stakeholders within it as well. So. The police department is a part of that, and they're concentrating on a lot of specific issues within town as a policy-wide scale. Um, but from with regard to that, that has provided me with a lot of connections that I definitely plan on utilizing um, to ensure the success of this club. And then there have also been, from a personal standpoint as the president of this, I have had a couple of internships that focus on a lot of different issues, and I do plan on using those connections to kind of implement 
some sort of um, pipeline system in which we could have a continuous um, a continuous cycle of resources that can really ensure that every issue that needs to be covered is covered. Well, you have a very large baton to toss when it's your um, time to graduate and you'll be sorely missed. I also just wanted to include real quick, um, I do the high school mentoring as a part of community service. And I know Miss Jennifer Ford, and she does have a lot of connections in the community and different aspects of just different things that we could ask her. So I could definitely be asking her any of the things that we need to tackle. Oh, and certainly just to interject as well, um, Miss Jennifer Jennifer Ford is part of the Human Rights Commission too. She was one of the ones who founded it, so she's certainly a really great resource to utilize. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dr. Daly will go there. We'll jump you over, Mr. Lepret. <laughs> yeah, I just want, well, I just wanted to thank Mr. Lepret and Mr. Hain for, for having their finger on the pulse of, of these clubs and seeing them through and for the students just to address some of the, perhaps some of the roadblocks that were mentioned as well. Um, there's a process for these clubs and the clubs, you know, all these clubs that we've approved the last few nights, they go to the superintendent for pre-approval um, they, there's a format where they get processed there, they're, you know, as a pilot for year one, we take data on the participation and, and how many hours they're part of it. And then we have a, a second year pilot and then it becomes a full club. So these, these all sound fantastic and we hope that they, they carry through. But I just wanted to point out one of the other pieces that I, I raised and why we paused and presented these two tonight as opposed to last week was as, as was addressed in the slide about the, the connection to the civics projects that I'd shared with you a few weeks ago. Um, you know, a concern that I had, not necessarily, you know, obviously the ideas are fantastic. I just wanted to make sure that as students are trying to come up with civics project ideas, that they weren't, you know, I think the question of what is a club and what is a project, I didn't want to have all those great ideas I saw on the slide um, take away from opportunities for students to, to do their civics project around it because the civics project has to be driven by students and it can't be something connected to a club or or that has an advisor. So uh, I really appreciated that they took the time to reflect on that and, and added a slide to it to, to address it head on, which I think is great. Because I think that's just a question we're gonna have as we do something new, um, how does that now change what, what we've always done? So I appreciate that that slight delay, but I think I, I did communicate directly with Shivy about this, but it was in no way a reflection of hesitation around why this is vitally important, but I just wanna make sure everyone involved in this club understands that. So. But thank you all for doing such a great job. And um, thank you. Anybody else want to go before Mr. LaPratt? <laughs> okay, we'll go to Mr. LaPratt. Oh, now? Okay. Yes, now, now it's your turn. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, nice nice job, ladies. Excellent. Um, excellent work, Chevy and, and Veronica. Um, so just two, two little uh additions here one um and that i think with uh maybe it goes back to miss embriano's point around chivy i think with with um once the club gets up and running we talk about it, it's like i think it's going to be really important to look at the the mission statement or the vision statement statement of what that language is and how though that language kind of guides the norms that you'll be um providing so that when students come in with specific ideas, they kind of get a sense of what um, what the norms are and how that's going to shape their activism and their voice and their and um, you know the point that they want to share. Like you say, we're not going to gatekeep, but I think that you know whatever that language is is going to be extremely important. Uh, and the other piece uh, that goes back to what Dr. Daly was saying about the Civic Action Project, like and just to clarify, and I don't I don't know if it was. Uh, if it was clear, 100% clear in the presentation, that the Civics Action Project is part of the social studies curriculum, which came with the 2018 new history and social sciences framework through Massachusetts. It's not a school generated expectation. It's part of the, the curriculum, part of that social studies curriculum. Uh, and therefore we're, you know, that's, that's how that fits in. We've then assessed it and shaped it to work with our uh, standard community service project, uh, so that they that they really uh, are, are uh, you know kind of a hand in glove type of thing, um, 
but I just want to make sure that anybody else is on the call that they get a sense of that. That's not, you know, the school imposing something else on top of you. Yeah, I think that was really well said about the uh, about the norms and 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 really the whole how this club is set up. It, it will it will you know propel everything forward in in, in the right way. So I thought that was well said, uh, Ms. Lepre. Okay. So seeing no more hands, I'm going to look for a motion to approve the Social Activism Club for as a club for the North Reading High School for starting this year. I will move that uh, the community vote to approve the Social Activism Club uh, for starting up this year. I second. Okay. Any discussion? We'll do a roll call vote. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. Janine? Hi. Diana? Hi. I'm an I as well. Passes 5 0. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you. Okay. Now, we're moving to middle school assistant principal. I'm, I'm a little conflicted on this one because my, my son will be losing his math teacher if this, if this happens. So I'm a little, a little concerned here, but I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Daly to talk about the appointment of the assistant principal at the middle school. Sure, and Dr. O'Connell is uh, teaching a course tonight and is unable to be here as well to, to recognize, but we are very excited to announce and share publicly um, that Ms. Laura Oliveto, who's on the call with us tonight, um, who's been a, a teacher in the district for 19 years, I believe, um, some that I've worked with um, my entire time in North Reading, and we've seen her certainly uh, grow and develop and take on those challenges of leadership in many different ways. And, and as many of you know, uh, when you're when you're becoming an administrator these days, you have to do what are called the PAL tasks. And there's four tasks, one around data, one around professional learning communities, one around evaluation, and one around community engagement. And so that's something I've been involved in and, and been you know involved in all aspects of that with the development of it. And so she and I have had a lot of conversations about, about becoming a leader. And I'm just so proud um, that, that we were able to, uh, again, find such a qualified candidate in, internally to work and, and really make a seamless transition um, for, for the middle school. Um, she's been, you know, she's worked with Mr. Maloney and, Ms. and Dr. O'Connell um, in a lot of ways as she, as she worked to become an administrator, and I think she's a natural leader and fit for the school. So I wanted to officially um, just announce that appointment and, and welcome uh, Laura to our team. She is officially beginning, I believe, on the 14th and going in through until June 30th in this interim role. So congratulations and thank you um, for all your hard work, Laura. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Daly. I'm really looking forward to hitting the ground running on Monday and rest assured, we will make sure everything's covered here. And um, I'm just really excited. It, like you said, I've been here for 19 years and it's really a second home. So to be able to take the next step in my career here is just, um, you know, I'm just super excited about doing this and making this next step. So thank you. Congratulations, thank you. Mrs. Olivetto. Thank you. And in, uh, the next agenda item is sort of a continuation of, of just invitation. I haven't, uh, since I've officially made the announcements, I haven't welcomed uh, Mr. Maloney to the meeting. And Mr. Clean also officially started um, on, on both of those folks to start in their new roles on December 1st. So they're both here this evening, and I just wanted to officially um, welcome them and, and thank them for all their support over the years, and, and congratulations on well-deserved um, promotion to an, an interim position as principal, Mr. Maloney, and obviously as, a, as assistant superintendent, um, Mr. Clean. So thank you to everyone, and, and welcome welcome aboard. Thank you, uh, Dr. Daly. Um about the opportunity thank you to the committee for for the opportunity and uh very excited and the batch community has been very welcoming and kind um over the past uh, week and a half um I said to many people that last monday was uh, kind of a difficult day for me at the middle school leaving uh my friends and, and colleagues and, and students um uh at the middle school but uh it was it was nice to be welcomed at the batch uh, by, by everyone. So thank you all and I um, look forward to working with you all. Congratulations. Congratulations, everyone. And it, it is nice to see that everybody gets opportunities here that, you know, wants to. Well, not everybody, but, you know, some people are able to. And so, 
you know, people that have put in so many years. Mr. Clean? It's been a whirlwind of a uh, eight days. Uh, Michael and I have, have shared a couple of stories, and Laura just more recently, um, how quickly your worlds change from um, one day to the next. And one of the greatest parts of, of our administrative team is the amount of support and the relationships that you share. I've been fortunate in my, my short um, tenure so far to be in all the schools, speak with all the administrators, start to speak with some of the curriculum leaders, um, and then I hope shortly after the new year to really start um, getting into more work with um, more classroom teachers, uh, students, um, excited about clubs that we heard. They, they line up with some of our district goals and the work that we have in front of us to have some student leading students leading the way with that will only um, allow us to follow with them as well. And I'm excited about that and working with those clubs. Um, and Paris, I think she left. I wanted to thank her because she did last Friday drop off a, a nice student council mug with, with candy in there and a handwritten letter and from the student council at North Ring High School. So I wanted to uh, publicly recognize the uh, my weight loss support program. <laughs> Dr. Daly, I just have to comment that I had a, a virtual meet and greet with the batch parents last night and I stumped uh, everyone was there uh, talking about internal candidates moving up. And I think maybe someone in this group would know the answer, but I asked them, I said, who I replaced as the assistant principal uh, school. And no one knew the answer. So really? hand, you know the answer. <laughs> Mr. Fauché. No. No. Mr. Fauché <laughs> hired me. They were Oh no, I know who it is. Can I say it right now? Guess you number can two. Your answer. <laughs> it was Patrick Daly. That's yes. right. <laughs> Chris knows. Oh, I remember Patrick Daly <laughs> hired me as a substitute <laughs> teacher. I hired right. Chris, right? <laughs> so the circle continues. Yeah. Cool. Thank you again, and we'll see you all soon. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you all. And. Patriots starting a little less than an hour, so we're going to keep moving moving forward here. Hey, have a good night. <laughs> good night, everyone. Okay. Dr. Daly, do you want to update on COVID testing? I think that's one of the main topics here tonight. Sure. So I've, I've presented now. I did an informational forum on Tuesday evening. I did an informational forum last night with the Board of Health. Um, I want to recognize Dr. Chamantosi, who is our school physician, who's here tonight as well. So thank you for joining us. Uh, she's been a, a wonderful asset through this whole process as we've investigated. I think I'd like to start off by saying to everyone, you know, my background is not medicine. Uh, and so there's probably folks in the audience that certainly know more about this. But I've, I've learned quite a bit in the last uh, six months or so, uh, different terms. And, and so I can say things like nasopharyngeal now without, um, without having to look twice at how it's pronounced. Uh, but... I, uh, Mr. Buckley, I, I have a presentation. Do you, you think it's better just to give some some big bullets at this point? As have folks all seen the presentations, or so I, I I leave it to my colleagues here. I don't know that we have to go through the full presentation because I had a quick conversation with Dr. Daly before, also, and you know I know the survey results that came out was pretty overwhelming in in terms of where what the community wants us to vote tonight. So. I think if you hit on the high level points and then we can just ask a few questions for follow up. Um, I think that's probably plenty for tonight. I'm seeing some thumbs up with that too, because I've, I've seen that presented. So essentially the, um, the survey, you know, we did speak with the nurses first and Dr. Tramantosi, um, got some initial feedback, some pros and cons that I then dug a little bit deeper and investigated more. Um, I do feel that I have the support of everyone at this point. The, the biggest point that I want to make and I'll make it several times, um, is that, you know, we, people need to stay home when they're sick. I think it was mentioned earlier tonight, and we have that consistently now. Um, we don't want this to change that in any way. And it's one of the big FAQs from the state presentation and from local. So these tests would be available for students who are symptomatic in school, which right now is a, is a very small number. But it will help us if anyone is, staff or students are symptomatic in school, Essentially, what it will do is allow us to begin that process for contact tracing much sooner. Currently, what happens if, if you're symptomatic, we send you home. You take three to five days sometimes to get test results, and then we're able to begin the contact tracing process. This, this testing in school would be only for those purposes for symptomatic students and staff, but would allow us to begin that tracing right away, would, would allow us to identify positive individuals where they could begin to isolate. 
So as Mr. Buckley mentioned, I also have surveyed staff and uh, the, the parent community. I've also surveyed, uh, I've included high school students in this as well. Um, the aggregate score is an 85% in favor um, of this right now. I can say that um, when you disaggregate, the teachers are nearly 100%. The staff had more questions, I think, and the parents were actually pretty high as well, um, closer to 90% uh, support. And so, and the student sample is pretty small right now. It's about 14 or 15, but we did, I did speak to students about this today a little bit. So I think it's important to hear their voice. So we would continue to get more information if this was supported tonight. Um, cost is a big question. So the, the cost, obviously, it, the testing is free, which is a major, major part of this. There are costs associated with additional PPE that would be needed, biohazard disposal, and there is also um, what's called a, a CLIA, I believe, the clinical, um, the, the license that we have to have in order to be a part of this study. Um, that's about $180, and it's valid, I believe, for two years. So we could be a part of, of this um, study. We would need to pay that. There would obviously be costs associated with the resources and time and reporting. I don't believe the resources, um, um, the reporting is exhaustive. Uh, I was asked that at the Board of Health last night, and I've looked at it again today. From everything that I can conclude, it's, it's not too much different than what I'm already doing. I already have to report all the positive cases. So I have to continue to do that and, and do this with the state. But we want to make sure that what we're asking of our nurses is not exhaustive. But there's 160 districts that are participating. And um, we do believe that this is, um, you know, something that's worthwhile. And Dr. Tramatosi would need to uh, place a standing order. And she would need to sign off. And I don't know, Dr. Tramatosi, do you want to just speak to your thoughts and your investigation of this? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for North Reading School District. I think it has um, little downside risk and it will provide you guys with just earlier detection and earlier contact tracing um, for the students and the staff. And I think it sounds like it's easy to do. Um, so it seems like a win-win. Um, so I'm in full support and I have no problem um, signing off on the standing order uh, to proceed with this. Right. So there's a few steps if it was approved that we would have to take. There's a bit of an application process um, to get some of these things in order. We would need the standing order. There's a checklist really from the department that we would have to follow. And once we do that, if we're approved, then we would be able to begin the training. Our school nurses would be the folks administering this test. It's a nasal swab just on the inside of the nose. It's not the full nasopharyngeal. Um, so it's a small 10-second um, uh, little Q-tip swab on each inside of each nostril. Um, students that are tested or staff that are tested, no matter whether they test positive or negative, would still be getting a follow-up test. So either way, they're still getting a, a PCR test for confirmation. But really what this allows is just to get that head start and to really to lessen anxiety. I talked to some, some uh, members of the school community who in recent weeks with these uptick in cases, there's not a lot of information and there's confusion, sometimes just waiting on to see whether any of those close contacts actually there's any spread. And I think once folks that have uh, some symptoms are able to find out that either they're, they're negative, um, that can be very, uh, can go a long way to lessen that anxiety, which I think is a big, big part of trying to um, keep us in school right now, is to, to control these numbers, to get ahead of it, and to lessen the anxiety around it. Because I'm concerned not only with COVID, but with fatigue and burnout of, of everyone involved, teachers especially, but certainly our nurses and even our parents and students. So having more information always helps to lessen anxiety, and, and I think that's important as well. Any questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Daly. I'll just, I just want to thank you for doing this. And one quick comment I would say is, I really appreciate where some, with some of these things that are coming up, how you've been proactive in asking people their opinion and doing some of these surveys. I think that's really helpful for us because we're only five people and, we're, and it's, it's really nice to hear from, you know, hundreds of parents and get their opinion as well. And Dr. Tremontosi, I don't think we've had an opportunity to meet, but just really thank you for all the work that you guys, you're doing behind the scenes and, you know, very actively in, in dealing with all of this. And so we appreciate having you here. It's my pleasure. It's, it's, it's been great to work with everyone, especially all your school, school nurses. All your students are in really good hands. That's great to hear. So I, I have a few quick comments, but I'm going to, I'll defer to other people first if they have any questions or comments. 
So uh, yeah, thanks. I I uh, I did was able to watch the uh, presentation from the state that uh, Dr. Daly in, uh, sent to us, and I, I I came out of that with uh, I guess being a little confused as to how the test would be used. But uh, after watching Dr. Daly's presentation to parents, uh, watching the replay of that, uh, it made a lot more sense to me. Um, the the one thing I was concerned about was that we did not treat, for instance, a negative test as the be all and end all uh, with a particular case. And, and I was very heartened to hear that, that that's really not the purpose of wh whether positive or negative, that's really not the purpose of, to, to determine, you know, once and for all, whether a person has COVID, but rather to um, set them on a path that more quickly uh, and perhaps in a way that, that whether it's a negative test or a positive test will will result in in, in more quickly deal, dealing with um, dealing with the results that we needed to deal with. So um, I I ended up understood once I understood exactly how you know what the purpose and how you were planning on using it. I thought it made a lot of sense and, and I'm fully in favor of it. Great. And I I would just I would just jump in and just say that I think. It, there, this is no panacea. This is no perfect solution to anything. But speed is really important when we're dealing with COVID. And you know, if you know, it, I don't see a negative to it. Um, cost is not very much. It's it's basically free from the state. If we can identify some people a little bit quicker and, and give notice a little bit quicker, I don't see a downside to that. The one concern that I had was if parents did have a concern, um, and it's been very clear that there are opt outs if if a parent is very concerned. So. You know, we have a protocol in place that's good. This is maybe a little bit better to give notice. And, you know, I think my first indication was thinking about like, what if my student needed to get tested? But then when I thought a little bit more, I thought about, well, what if my student was a close contact, you know? And so I think parents have to think about it, not just as their student being tested, but what if their student was a close contact and they got that information just a few days earlier about they were, you know, in, in contact with somebody maybe before you go and bring them to grandma or grandpa. And, and so, you know, with anything, we've all been just trying to get information very quickly. Um, I think, Dr. I appreciate Dr. Daly giving all the information, getting it out there. And if 85 to 90% of the, the, the community here, if the teachers, if the nurses, if the doctor all recommend it, um, if Board of Health recommends it, I don't think we should not recommend it. So that's my quick thoughts. I don't know if anybody else, Diana, Chris, Janine, any Comments, thoughts? Okay. So if we have nothing, well, and anybody from the community, please, again, feel free to type in. Um, if we have no other thoughts, then I would entertain a motion to approve North Reading pursuing the Buy Next Now COVID testing opportunity. I don't think we can vote actually on it. I think it's just, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Daly, but we're just voting to approve North Reading um, pursuing the opportunity to get this testing, correct? Taking the next steps, yes, in the process. Yep. I can have a motion from somebody. I will happily move to uh, that the committee vote to approve North Reading's uh, pursuing this uh, testing, the Binax testing opportunity. Second. Okay, and a second by Ms. Spoutwell. So we'll do a roll call vote here if there's no further discussion. Um, Rich. Aye. Diana? Aye. Chris? Aye. Janine? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes by zero. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. If, if I may, just before she leaves, because we have here, Dr. Tremontosi has been a great asset. She's mostly worked with me in my role as assistant superintendent um, with professional development. She's come in on some of our days where we've had topics from anxiety, stress, mental health, and she's offered some wonderful professional development for our staff. She's been a consultant on our, our sleep and our school start times um, and done much, you know, like my relationship with the nurses, similar with Dr. Schumann, I've worked with her much more this year than I've ever anticipated, but she's been there for every question. And she's even assisted our staff with uh, questions around their symptoms and, and, and supports around testing and, and the like. So thank you so much for your continued support of the district. Thank you. I, I enjoy it. I'm here to help everybody. And um, you guys should be proud of your district. Everyone's um, working really great together. Thank you. Not to mention she's been with me the last three nights this week. So thank you. <laughs> I just wish all doctors were as concise and direct as she is. <laughs> Not always.
<laughs> okay. So thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Uh, so we move on the last new matter. I guess we'll go to the enrollment update. And Mr. Connolly, Assistant Superintendent Connolly, we'll turn it over to you. Great. Um, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. I have a brief presentation. Um, I am going to try to move through it relatively quickly because I think most of the, the enrollment trends that we've been talking about over the last, are, are relatively have stayed consistent over the last few years. So I'm just going to touch upon a few things here and certainly leave time for some questions. Um, but I don't think, I think everyone's kind of familiar with this process that we go through on an annual basis just to try to predict and get a sense of what our both uh, next year's enrollment looks like as well as the three and five year, 10 year trends. Um, and the biggest um, piece of data that we look at for that is our historical data trends. So we can certainly look at what's happened in the past and try to get a sense of um, seeing the progression you know, rates from students that um, advance to the next grade level from, from grade to grade as they as the cohorts move through their um, their educational you know, process and try to see the reliable percentages of, of increase and decrease of students. And from that data, we can develop trends for um, on a three year, five year, 10 year models. Um, and it's also important to look at obviously what's happening in uh, the economy and in, in the real estate market, um, the turn the turnover and, and developments of, of housing and, and homes in North Reading. Um, so that's data that we look at because all that data will have an impact on the the ratios that are used and on projections. Um, and then we always want to review the current conditions and state of the schools impact of the current situation we're in with the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So that, that's kind of the process we tried to follow this year. Um, so I'm just going to briefly talk touch upon our historical enrollment projected, take a look at how it's impacting each level. Then this gives a little bit of a little snapshot into the budget development process as enrollment um, is always the first thing we look at in terms of staffing levels for the following year. So we'll get a sense of to see what the FY22 budget could look like. Um, but historical enrollment, you know, going back to 1950, you can kind of look at what's happened in North Reading. This has been pretty cyclical and this trend's been pretty consistent. It's almost like two bell curves um, that, as you can see, it peaked back in the 1970s then declined heavily and then was on an inc increase until about the, the mid-2000s, 2008, and then on somewhat of a steady, steady, or mo actually a moderate, a moderate decline since. Um, but we're showing evidence that the, the, this moderate decline is stabilizing and we'll see an increase um, at some point. Um, Ten-year history, more more recent history, you can get a look at what's happening. So again, a, just a kind of a moderate a moderate decline there from from the district district level. Uh, October one enrollment was at two thousand three hundred and nine students. Um, we were at two thousand three ninety seven. We had predicted we would be a little bit higher in the about in the two thousand um, you know three hundred and forty or so range, so a little bit lower than than what we had anticipated. And there's a couple of gray levels um, that that progression ratio was a little bit lower than, than we than we anticipated for. I think from a variety of factors, um, I think we're we're playing in we're playing into that. Certainly the pandemic and and folks maybe choosing to be maybe more virtual at, at some grade levels, I think had a had a small role in that uh, as well. So if we look at our enrollment projections going forward, um, as you can see here, pretty pretty stable enrollment. So I don't think we're going to see major major changes um, from the district standpoint. Some slight fluctuations amongst the grade levels, um, but relatively stable enrollment over the next five years. Um, you know, going down district wide slightly next year, and then we're going to see an increase, and then it's it's stabilizing. And I think what ultimately we're going to see is our enrollment at you know, all kind of working towards the 2,380, 2,400 and over the next, you know, five to seven years. And then that's, you know, somewhat where we're showing we're going to be kind of stabilizing at um, as we approach the, the five to 10 year mark. But we're not going to, I don't think we're going to see major, major changes um, over the next few years from a district wide standpoint, as you can see. Um, at the elementary level, 
Um, again, we're actually going to predict a, a slight, slight decrease next year. Um, as you can see from the table, um, kindergarten enrollment is anticipated to decrease by, by nine students. Um, most of that's contributed by the birth rate um, in the census data. I think that's been a, a really key, reliable piece of data that helped, helped predict kindergarten enrollment. But that, again, that's probably one of the toughest things to predict um, is what's happening at the kindergarten level. And that's the, one of the biggest unknowns um, each year. Uh, but as you can see, even though there will be some changes in enrollment at each grade level, the district-wide enrollment is relatively stable. So we, we don't anticipate any significant changes or, or need uh, for at the, you know, necessary from a staffing perspective at, at the elementary level. If you look at the middle school, I think it's, it's relatively the same story. Uh, you know, next year actually has a slight increase with a little bit of a higher six, you know, incoming sixth grade enrollment expected. Um, but you know, overall, I uh, I think we're over the next three years. I think enrollment's going to be relatively stable. Um, I think with some of the the developments in turnover of homes and some other and some of the economic real estate data shows you that beyond the three years, some of that decline that you see there, I don't think. Well, I think that will change as we get closer to those dates and those years. I think that's going to moderate, and you'll see an increase. And in there's there's real estate economy market data that that supports that. Um, certainly in the community and in, in the state. Um, if you look at the high school level, the high school has experienced probably the biggest change in enrollment over the past three to five years. Um, they've declined from a, one point around 750. I think this year, was, currently we're looking at 662. We had anticipated this decline as <clears throat> they had kind of a bubble that shortly after the, the new high school, middle school opened, there was a, a bubble of high middle school classes that kind of moved its way through the high school and, and those that cohort of students is kind of graduated. So we're, we're seeing that, you know, level off and we don't see major changes happening over the next three years. And then I think beyond the three year mark, as you can see, there's evidence that that enrollment is going to start to increase and we're going to get back closer to the 690, 700 um, students mark at, at the high school. So overall, um, based on the the, the enrollment stabilizing and, and, and moderate changes, we don't see a, a need for significant um, staffing, uh, both increases or decreases at, at all the levels, really, from, from an elementary, middle school, and high school perspective. Um, in looking at some planned developments, I did meet with um, some of the community planner uh, with at the town level and um, Danielle McKnight and I didn't meet and she did share with me some data and some some planned housing and other developments um, that it will be going on in the community and that are expected to kind of come online over the next three to five years are all at some somewhat different timelines but as you can see there's some new housing units and some new um, you know age 55 and you know and over units that I think will produce some some school age children um, and as we get more information and as this starts to occur, I think you'll see some of the projected declines, you know, over the next three to five years moderate and we'll see a return um, of some school age children. And I think that's why it's important to do this process on, on an annual basis. Um, if you look at our enrollment history and our projections, um, it kind of in summary, I think that, you know, the biggest changes certainly occurred at the high school um, with the with the decline that we have seen and that we did anticipate, that's you know all those major changes are, are stabilizing and, and and we're not anticipating any major changes in the next three years. Um, certainly, elementary and middle school level is going to remain uh, consistent and stable. Um, and the, again, as I just mentioned too, as the economy and real estate market continue to improve, that in migration um, we we do anticipate will begin to return to North Reading, and we think some of these projected declines will start to, to change and moderate. And um, as we look, you know, over, beyond three years in these in these projections. So that was kind of a high level overview, but I think it kind of gives you the gist of of the of the data and where we're at, and what what some of the discussions in the budget process will look like in a, in a couple months. Um, so with that being said, I, it was a high level overview. I'm just going to open it up to, to any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. I think it's clear and detailed. I appreciate you putting it together. Um, 
I mean, I think there's the one thing to point out is, you know, even if we talk about a, a slight decrease, this is over, you know, 13 grades in the, in the district. And so, you know, if we talk about an average of one or two kids, like it, it, in a class, like it's really, it doesn't have any impact on, it's not saying like, oh, we're going to have 15 fewer kids so we can get rid of a, a teacher. Absolutely. Know? It's right, spread out over everybody. So, I, to me, this just looked like, you know, it is kind of standard. Not nothing's really yep. changing. But I think just, that's the, the biggest message. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. it's just really the developments in the future that could be, you know, the Elm Street development in particular that could have a a major impact. Um, but that's about all I have. Any anybody have any questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. So. I'm going to go back to continued business now. If people aren't having dropped off the call yet, we'll uh, see how many make it through policies. Um, I think uh, Mrs. Imbriano and Mr. McGowan were sort of leading this the last time. So I'm going to turn it over to one of them to guide us through the second readings that we need. I think it was Mrs. Imbriano. Yeah, I'm here. I'm just getting to the wording from last time because it's so much easier than to have to repeat everything. So bear with me one second. Yeah, I was just kib kibitzing last time. I had promised to not kibitz at all this time. So <laughs> there we go. So and why why don't we just do this? Why don't we have Mrs. Imbriano make a motion? We can get a second on it, and then we can see if there's any discussion. And okay. All right. Perfect. <laughs> uh, 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 okay. I will make a motion. Uh, to accept for, as a second reading the non-discrimination and harassment policy formerly known as AC to be made into policy ABBA to replace the old ABBA policy. I second. Rebuttal from McGowan. <laughs> no discussion. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. Rich. Aye. Diana. Aye. I'm an I as well. Thank you. This is Imbriano. I make a motion to accept as a second reading to eliminate the following policies G A A A, J C A, and J C A D, as they are redundant towards the A B B A policy and is noted the A B B A policy. And is noted, sorry, on the ABBA policy. I second. Any discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. Rich. Aye. Diana. Aye. I'm an I as well. Passes by zero. Is that all, or do we have one more, Janine? No, there's two, oh, two more. Of course there is, sorry. The, um, I make a motion to accept the second reading of the civil rights grievance procedure known as ABBAR1. I second. Any discussion? We'll do a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. And then I as well. Okay, keep going. Oh, okay. yeah. I make the motion, <laughs> sorry, to accept the second reading to eliminate the following. Oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I make a motion to accept the second reading of the Title IX Sexual Harassment Grievance Procedure to be named ABBAR2. Seconded. Discussion? Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. 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 Diana? Aye. I'm an I as well. Okay, next. I make a motion to accept the first reading to eliminate the following procedures. G-A-A-A-R, J-C-A-R, and J-C-A-D-R as they are redundant to the A-B-B-A-R, A-B-B-A-R-1, and A-B-B-A-R-2. Second. And I should note, last motion passed 5 0. Um, so we'll do a vote on this one. Janine? Aye. Chris? 
Aye. Rich. Aye. Diana. Aye. I'm an I. Five passes five zero. And that's it. Yay. Good job, everyone. Thank you, Janine. Yep. Some sort of recognition from Sweden for naming all these policies after ABBA. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I also should. I also should have noted that we, you know, that the we were unable to have the Hood School presentation tonight, but that will be rescheduled. I think we know that, but I should just say that on the public record because it was on the agenda for the evening, and that has been pushed back till sometime in after Correct. the holidays. Correct. There were some unforeseen circumstances there, and we we're going to push that back to the January. Uh, meeting as well, and so that that will be on the um, on the agenda coming up. And the good news about the Title IX policies, there are still some more that we will do at our next meeting. And um, from what I've read, the president-elect in his first hundred days may rewrite and revise these again. So we we might see um, some more time on this this year. But this is um, I, I do appreciate everyone's feedback, and I will continue to get more feedback on the process. So I you know I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so we are up to routine matters, unless there's anything else I'm missing here. The, we're going to go to minutes, so Mrs. Imbriano, you get to lead us in minutes again. Turn back my speaker. Um, seems how I read from the minutes last time, I make a motion to accept the open session minutes of November 19th, 2020, as written, and thank you, Cindy. I'll second. Okay. Oh. Second by Chris, we'll say. Yeah. Um, and we'll do a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Diana? Aye. Aye. Rich? Oh, sorry. Aye. Rich? Aye. <laughs> I'm an aye as well. Five passes five to zero. That's the only minute. Yep. I see that one. Thank you very much. Just don't have the whole packet in front of me. So <laughs> thank you, Cindy. Um, okay, budget update, Mr. Connolly. Yes, thank you, Mr. Buckley. So in your packet this evening was the November budget report, which essentially summarizes activity through the end of November. Um, really not a lot of new information from the previous report. Um, you know, most of the, the information and the trends and the major drivers here at this point is all items I've kind of spoken to in the past, you know, certainly because of the, the COVID-19 situation and reopening, um, we had a heavy focus on purchasing a lot of uh, sanitation and cleaning supplies and PPE, as well as upgrading um, some of our facility operations and HVAC equipment and improving ventilation in certain areas. Um, certainly technology uh, needs and e equipment and uh, instructional equipment for the classrooms. That was all a heavy focus in the summer and in September. Um, we were able, we've been really able to leverage um, to the greatest extent possible the federal grants that are available um, through our reopening grants, um, as well as the Technology Essentials Grant and, and other CARES Act funding with the town. Dr. Daly and I have been in close communication with um, Liz Rourke and Michael Gilberto um, to discuss the school share of, of the Municipal Cares Act funding. Um, so we have kind of settled on amount around $500,000, which we are working to use that um, to, the, to the greatest extent possible. We're certainly on pace to spend that by the end of the month. We've had to make some, some minor tweaks and amendments to the reopening grant um, based on uh, you know several factors and the fact that you know we now know that we're we have up to five hundred thousand dollars to spend with the with the town funding um, so we are in the process of doing that and as I, I think things are relatively considering all the factors that came at us going relatively smooth um, and we're, we're doing the best we can to, to get the equipment in um, that we may need beyond December, because I think the biggest level of financial uncertainty or financial things to monitor and be aware of is that these expenses aren't going to end on December 31st. Many of these expenses, some of the some of them are certainly one-time expenses, and that we looked and we 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 did some upgrades and we bought some equipment, and in honesty, we kind of stockpiled here and there to to, to have as they arise and as the need is there for the school year. Uh, but some of these are reoccurring expenses that are going to continue. So um, the fact that um, 
you know, the state wasn't able to to lobby for the, the extension of those funds beyond December uh, was somewhat disappointing. Um, but I think we're in an okay place to be able to pivot and, and, and address any needs that may arise beyond that. Um, but I think it's just something to, to, to monitor because there's, there's certainly needs that are going to arise. Um, and we already know a, f a few of them um, because of the you know pandemic that we couldn't have anticipated around extracurricular, around athletic, around technology. Um, and it was nice having the federal sources there that at the moment I will not be there beyond, beyond December. So I think that's kind of the biggest area that we have to kind of watch and monitor and continue to have conversations with the finance planning team and, and, and bring those, those needs as they arise and as, um, you know, at that forum. And then obviously to, to each of you at, at, at the future meetings so we can uh, be upfront um, with where we stand in that. Um, most of the other uh, other expenses are items I've talked about. Um, I, again, you know, the, on the payroll side of things, I think we've certainly budgeted positions and placed them in some of these, these federal grant sources. Many of those positions are going to kind of continue. So we'll I think we're in a, a okay position and a, and a solid financial position to kind of to address that, but we'll have to uh, continue to, to watch that as we go into the second half of the fiscal year. There are some balances in certain line items, um, and there are some areas of savings um, because of a variety of factors, and some of which is, are related to the COVID-19 is um, that, you know, there's less extracurricular clubs, for example, um, we, that may be running and there's, there's less special education transportation out of district transportation and so forth happening. Um, so there are, there are some saving areas as well. Uh, but overall, I, I really do believe that we've, we've done a, a good job as we can leveraging the, 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 the financial resources that are available. And I think we're in a, a, a solid financial position um, as we look to, you know, five months into the fiscal year. I do want to talk a little bit about food service. Um, again, I, I, you know, food service program is certainly operating at a loss on a month to month basis, but that, that loss is going down each month. We, we anticipated that we would operate at a loss um, for the first four, you know, four or five months of, of the year based on the fact that we, we knew that participation was going to be at about, you know, about 50% um, of, of what it, what we're used to it being and the, that those a la carte sales weren't going to be there. So the USDA, SDA's extension of their free mails program was significant and, and we're, we're doing everything we can to, as we said, marketing the program is key and increasing that participation is key. But we've seen an increase on a daily basis up from about an average of 550 mails, which was the case in September in early October to we're now looking at an average of between 700 and 750 mails a day. So that that is good, and and um, and we certainly like that trend. Um, I was on an encouraging phone call um, about one o'clock this afternoon from members of the Department of Education, financial department, who have kind of recognized across the state that food service is a financial challenge this year, and that participation is down, um, and to no one's fault, but. Uh, on the situation that we're in. So they are they have released $5 million to be used for all school districts and charter schools in the state of Massachusetts to help um, defray some of the, the, the loss of revenue or the new COVID-19 um, costs that districts had to experience, particularly in the food service program. So we, we expect to receive some level of funding um, by the end of the month from um, the state uh, in the form of a, a grant to help offset some of these costs and defer some of the loss of revenue. So that that's significant. I won't know the amount of that until for maybe another week or two. Um, the encouraging thing to me was the methodology of allocation that they're going to use is they're gonna look at the amount of mails sold between April through November as a as a way to to allocate the funding and i believe north reading was a very active um had a very active mails program during the school closure period last spring and then during this fall 
um, that we did continue to operate. And I, I believe that will serve us well um, to try to you know, increase or maximize this allocation that will that will be coming down through through this five million dollars that's been released by by the state. So stay tuned for that. But that's certainly encouraging. Um, we did also apply for a grant, um, and I actually appreciate um, Chairman Scott Buckley who alert, alerted my my attention of a grant through I think the MASC web uh, listserv. Um, that there was a gr grant through the New England Dairy Council that's being made available, um, and the due date was November 20th. <clears throat> so I did submit a, an application for that grant. Um, again, it's similar. It's similar. Um, it's to, to you know defray the cost of of new expenses and, and staffing costs from the COVID-19 and your food service program, and. Uh, I did get some. So I don't. I don't know if we're gonna. Our application will be accepted, but we we did get um, notice that they're reviewing our application carefully. And I was interviewed um, on Monday this week from the review committee um, about our application. And I am due. We're due to find out around mid December whether or not that will be awarded to us. And we applied for sixty five thousand dollars. Um, so we'll just keep our fingers crossed because every little bit will certainly help. Um, that being said, I'll open it up to any any other questions. Questions or comments? I will. I'll just you know thank you, Mr. Connolly, for doing this. Like I think, you know, we. I think I think we sometimes we take you for granted. But, you know, we are just so fortunate to have you here. I mean, I trust beyond that now over four years you know i mean i have faith and blind faith in what you're doing and that you're handling everything um you know like you mentioned i forwarded that grant and like literally like i think two days later you had already submitted it um you know i mean it's just so so important in this time of you know of chaos that we have somebody like you here to you know keep an eye on on the budget and so i'm just very thankful for that um i have one or two questions for you number one was the food service is lost. Is that something that could be covered by COVID as well? Like, uh, can the can if like if we're running a shortage on food service, is that something that we could use COVID funds or not? It no. is. So that is it. It, it would qualify because anything that's kind of unbudgeted or new related to COVID, which we certainly had new expenses. We certainly bought some equipment and bought some sneeze guards and some some um, plexiglass and. Some sealing machines to prepackage the mails um, safely, as well as warming and cooling bags to tra and dollies to transport mails. So there was a, some, some supplies and equipment that was one time um, that would all be covered. Some of the staffing costs that are specifically devoted to the, the <clears throat> grab and go curbside program, um, which is particularly exists because of COVID um can certainly be covered so th that we did amend some of that reopening grant um the the federal reopening grant the 225 per pupil to cover some of those costs we were hoping some of that would come through potentially a lot be able to quite honestly flow through the, the cares act funding with the town um but because that that five hundred thousand dollars i think um you know, most of that was already spoken for for technology and, and facility related needs, PPE related needs. So we did amend and write some of those into into the um, reopening grant. Um, but both, if quite honestly, if you know, based on the amount that we get from this new development with the state, as well as if we get funding from that that additional grant. Um, it potentially, if uh, that were to happen, we could we could put some of those costs into there as well, and then be able to use some of that other funding in the reopening grant um, elsewhere. Excellent. And then my, the only other question I had was in in our packet there was a there was an email about the coaching contracts. Um, I don't know if that was supposed to be in there or not, but um, I, I don't know if we have it. I think that's just for the winter uh, sports. Is that something that we, we want to, that's supposed to be addressed today or? or? Yeah, I, I saw it in there. And I wasn't sure if that just got in mine or if that got in everyone's. I, I'm thinking that might have might have mistakenly kind of got into the um, the scan document, but I believe it was just an email from me saying when 
when the coaches were due to be be paid. Yeah, well, that could be um, a clerical, that could be a clerical error. I can, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay, I just didn't know if we were if we needed approval or anything. I think we had already talked about some of that before, but I didn't know if that was something we needed to address yeah. today. I didn't see it on the agenda. So, um, yeah. any other comments or questions for Mr. Connolly? Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Daly. Yeah, but, um, okay. yeah, I did have. There was a student activity report in there as well. Oh um, yeah, that's the quarter one report. So we we you know you, I think you're used to seeing this format of of reporting. Um, so we did reconcile and close out the quarter one, which is activity through the end of September. So as we've been doing, you see your the certified bank reconciled balances of each school school's account in the sub account balances for the high school and um, the, the the middle school uh, we're still we're still trying to work with the class of 2020 to um, address their their year in balance I know they've donated some of that back to the district so we'll have to sweep what they've donated into a gift account and we're still waiting to see uh, they still have yet. Typically, they would have come in Thanksgiving. I, I, I feel like the COVID pandemic is impacting some of this, but we're still waiting to close some of that out with them. So I don't know if there's any any other questions, but things are in things are in good shape. They continue to to go well there. Okay. No, I don't think I got any questions on that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Move on to staffing. Dr. Daly, any staffing update? Uh, no no report at this time. Okay. Um, bids and donations. Mr. McGowan. Yes, I move that the school community vote to accept with gratitude a generous donation of $500 from Ms. Lily Fang to be used at the principal's discretion at the Hood School. I second. Any discussion? <clears throat> and we'll do the vote. Rich? Aye. Aye. Diana? Aye. Janine? Aye. And I as well. Passes 5 0. And that was it, right? I believe so. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Subcommittee updates. No updates at this time, although we did have a finance planning team meeting, I believe. And I don't think there was a whole lot that we went through, to be perfectly honest. And so. Yeah, I think it was pretty much, there's not much to be talked about yet. So we'll, in fact, we didn't even schedule a meeting for December. No, I mean, I think the only thing we really talked about was making sure that th that the, there is no extension, as Mr. Hanley said, of the, um, of the grant money. So if anything, anything for COVID we're going to use has to be through the end of the year, the calendar year. So I think that was the biggest takeaway I think we had from that. Um, in terms of upcoming meetings, policy subcommittee me meeting policy subcommittee is meeting on December fourteenth at one p.m. Finance planning team is meeting on January eighth um, at eight a.m. Administrative report, Dr. Daly, anything? Just a few brief items. Um, I just wanted to mention that the annual report from the North Shore Collaborative. I do have that, and I will be sharing that out. And we can look at that at our next meeting. Um, and I could have mentioned this earlier, but I, I saved it for here. We did get from the state a donation of cloth masks. So there are enough uh, masks for one per student. And um, so we, we did have um, our, our, one of our drivers pick those up today. And that's just additional PPE being provided by the state. We feel like we are in good position with the PPE that we've purchased. And again, I'll just echo what you said, Mr. Uh, Buckley. You know, I didn't think Michael Connell could work any harder, and and then then this year hit, and he's just done such a great job with our facilities, our supplies, our orders. I mean, we've really been well prepared for this, and and, and very well positioned, um, I should say, when I talk to other districts too. So I always want to thank him for that. But these additional uh, materials from the state are great. Michael also participated in a call recently with um, the state about. Uh, ventilation systems and there's there's more um, you know any anything that that is available for us we continue to apply for and put in for and so we may have some updates more soon on that as well so I just want to to thank him and and you know continue to share all that we're doing to make our schools as safe as possible great excellent. thank you excellent okay any correspondence dr. Daly none at this time Okay, I think we voted 
it seems like the committees found that Thursday nights are working okay. So our next two meetings are going to be Thursday, January 14th and Thursday, January 28th, both at 6.30 p.m. Um, I think it will be to be determined if we're in person and virtual or the public will definitely be virtual. And I guess we'll update if we will be in at the distance learning lab or not. Yes. And I think that's all. Unless anybody else has anything else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I so moved. So moved. Oh. Okay. I'll meet you. Mr. McGowan, can I have a second? Mrs. Imbriano, you want a second? I'll second it. There we go. Any discussion? Uh, Mr. McGowan. Aye. Uh, Mrs. Imbriano. Aye. Mrs. Boutwell. Aye. Chris. Aye. Uh -huh. Aye as well. Um, passes 5 0. Thank you all for the time tonight, and I will see you. Thanks, guys. Oh, well. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.